first off, uh, we just want to welcome Dr. Chad Fortune uh, as our special guest tonight. Um, he's going to be talking about concussions, um, what we can do on our end uh, if, if a concussion occurs at uh, one of our locations and uh, what what's our basically our best practices um, when witnessing a concussion. Um, you know, it's, it's great to have our, almost our entire staff here tonight and doing it in, in this way. Um, in person would be great, but I think this is just much easier on everybody's schedule. So um, really, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fortune, for helping us out and uh, making us smarter. <laughs> Happy to be so, here. Thanks. You can uh, take it away whenever you're ready. Awesome. Well, thank you, Craig, and I'd like to thank Craig and I9 Sports for the opportunity to talk about something that is a fairly hot topic in the world of sports and certainly pertains to even uh, adolescent and younger sports. So hopefully this can provide a good educational basis uh, to all of you. Um, I'm sure this is nothing new, but hopefully we can give you a few uh, tricks and pearls to help you along the way. This can be extremely casual. So if anybody has any questions, um, I don't know if I can hear you live, but I'm sure Craig can. So he can interrupt me at any point and please stop me anytime you uh, wanna go over anything. Uh, but with that being said, um, I'm Dr. Chad Fortune. I'm an orthopedic surgeon with uh, Wilmington Health. I uh, have been here in town for about six years. I actually started in Wisconsin and I did my undergrad training in physical therapy. So I worked as a uh, physical therapist for almost six years. So I have a pretty keen understanding of the rehab side of things as well, of course, as the uh, surgical side. Um, I took a job in Cleveland, Ohio, and that's where I did my uh, med school and my orthopedic surgery residency. And then we uh, went to Los Angeles for an extra year uh, specializing in uh, sports medicine. Um, so I am uh, proud and excited to be uh, part of Wilmington Health now, um, their orthopedic and sports medicine uh, department and uh, leading the charge in terms of uh, sports medicine care. So again, excited to be part of this, excited to be part of I-9. Um, I've got two uh, kids that are actively involved in sports all throughout the area. So it's an extremely exciting area, exciting time. And again, it's a privilege to be with you guys tonight. So with that being said, I don't have any disclosures pertinent to this talk. So we're going to talk about concussion. And uh, again, concussion has been a, a hot topic in the world of sports. Um, for those of you who like the NFL, you can tell over the last five years they've made a concerted effort to try to address the head injury issues. And of course, we're talking about a different kind of progression of head injuries when you're playing high school football, college football, and professional football. But we've all seen the uh, headlines with uh, cerebral traumatic encephalopathy, CTA, CTE, and the traumatic effects that multiple concussions have, multiple undiagnosed concussions, multiple significant concussions, and just the world that was part of uh, contact sports 50 years ago and how things have uh, changed or needed to change. And so hopefully we can again provide a little information on this and kind of where we are from the youth uh, standpoint. But what a concussion typically should be is a mild form of a traumatic brain injury. Typically these tend to resolve over the course of days to weeks. Um, it involves some type of physical force to the head. And we're all aware of, of course, the football head-to-head -head contact, but again, it's the basketball player on the basketball court that falls down to his uh, buttocks first and then hits his head on the back of the floor. It's the soccer player that goes up to head a ball wrong and gets a head injury or contacts another head. It's the uh, lacrosse player with a stick to the head. It's anything that you can imagine that can cause some type of force to the head. Um, it also doesn't have to be a contact injury. Um, and this is the reason, as a side note, that regardless of helmet technology, there's, no, there's always gonna be the risk for concussion because the brain is secured in a layer of cerebral spinal fluid inside the skull that kind of bathes it and provides nutrition, but also provides uh, protection for it. But because of that, there's movement. So any acceleration, deceleration injury as pictured in that middle one on the bottom can cause injuries as the brain sloshes to the front of the head and bangs the front and then sloshes to the back 
and kind of bangs the back. So being aware of all the ways that these injuries can occur is really the first thing that coaches, uh, people involved in athletics kind of need to be aware of. The goal of tonight is to not make you a medical expert, but it's to allow you to be the person that um, is well-educated on this topic, can talk to parents and guardians and families. And as we get into older kids where we need to protect them and college athletes, professional athletes, being able to tell them that and explain to them why it's important to not just say, oh, I, it's cool, I see, see stars, I have ringing in my ears, I'm ready to go back in. I mean, you have to educate the athlete to protect themselves. So this is just a slide. It's a, a bar graph and it's not meant to scare anybody, but it just tells us that there's a ton of stuff going on in the brain. So it's a very complex process that happens. There's no real physical signs on CT or MRI of concussions, but there is a disruption of how the brain works. So on the bottom axis, it's days, and on the uh, vertical axis, it's different things. So there's an ion imbalance that tends to resolve pretty quickly. Symptoms like lethargy and ringing in the ears or vision problems or memory issues may take a couple of weeks. But even after that athlete's been cleared to return to play, you still may have some abnormal metabolism issues that are occurring that can occur up to a month to recover. I mean, you can kind of think about a knee sprain where you sprain a ligament. You treat it acutely, you might get back, but that ligament hasn't fully healed or that fracture hasn't fully healed for weeks or months or even longer than that. So it's the same thing with this mild traumatic brain injury. So what do we want from a group of people involved in dealing with high school or adolescent athletes is really just to be aware. So be aware that these happen, be aware that they happen with all types of sports and all ages of sports. And there's some things that hopefully you'll glean from this talk about who's more at risk and of course, what to do as that person that's immediately in contact with them. So just again, knowing that this happens, understanding the difference in, differences in risk between certain sports and certain activities, but also understanding your athletes. And again, if you're coaching a group of nine-year-olds for one season, you're not going to intimately know them that well, but throughout a few practices, you might understand who's the kid that's going to go head first and dive right away or put his head into the problem or just be a little more aggressive. So maybe in the back of your head, you think, okay, if something happens, I can see that happening with him or her. Um, understand kind of their personalities. What are their quirks? How do they talk? How do they respond to you? So if there ever is a question of a head injury, you know kind of their baseline. I mean, obviously for a professional athlete, you have cognitive and neurological and scat testing and all this uh, plethora of testing before the season, but that doesn't happen with youth sports and that, that's fine. But just understanding who your athletes are, what positions they're gonna play, what positions are more at risk. And I don't know, how different youth groups work in terms of, I'm sure there's a disclaimer and a sign off to play, but at some level you may have a, a medical history that gets filled out. So you know if they have any type of other issues that might predispose them to recovery. And we'll talk about some of this uh, down the road. So risk factors, um, obviously with a concussion, any past concussion makes you more at risk for a future concussion. Uh, studies have shown that female athletes may be more at risk. Um, obviously, the type of activity, so what sport, is it a contact sport versus a non-contact sport? What position, and then of course, what style of athlete is that? Is it somebody that's going to put their body at risk without question, or is it somebody that's hesitant? Um, what might prolong their recovery from a basic uh, mild concussion? Obviously, a lot of stuff has to do with the number of concussions they've had, um, the duration of the symptoms afterwards. Um, we know that people that have headaches on a chronic basis or migraines, depression, mood disorders, anxiety, learning disabilities, youth, they all tend to recover slower from uh, concussions. So going back to the mechanism. So now we're on the field or practice and you're looking, you understand that these happen, you kind of understand who your athletes are and what they're doing and you're being aware of the surroundings and assistance also helping you with that, parents, family. 
but is there a direct contact to the head? So did you see the athlete fall to the floor and come back and hit the back of their head on a hardwood floor? Was there a play where athletes went up to head the ball and their heads collided as well as the ball? Is there a mechanism of injury that occurred that makes you concerned? Was it just a whiplash? Did somebody get checked from the side and you saw their neck and head go flying like if they were in a car accident? All those things should raise your awareness to the possibility that a concussion might have occurred. So, I mean, you can pause for a second if it's something that you think is mild and just kind of assess and watch the situation. If there's no change in behavior and the athlete brushes it off, maybe you don't think anything of it. But if there's any concern at all, the athlete needs to come out immediately and at least have a discussion. So now we're on the sideline and you think that there was a mechanism that could have caused a concussion. If we're at a uh, high school level, middle school, professional level, you're going to have somebody like myself as an orthopedic surgeon covering the game, especially if it's a contact sport. You hopefully have an athletic trainer who will go through all these things. But as the coach, as the administrator, you're going to be wanting to be part of that team. You're not gonna be wanting to be somebody who fights against that process. And so that's kind of what this whole big educational push, even in the NFL is about with independent neurologists, the medical tents and all that stuff. So you don't need to do a sideline medical exam, but if something doesn't seem right, then something probably isn't right. So the basic rule is if they've had a head injury and they have any change in symptoms, they're done for the day. And it's that easy. And coaches, even at the high school level, much to their chagrin, understand that. And so if they've had an injury that could cause a concussion and they come to the sideline and they have a new headache or they say, well, I feel like I passed out for a second or I hit my head really hard, anything, even if they're behaving normally, they're done for the day. So it's as simple as that. And that's really where your role kind of comes to a head is that pulling them out because you're not going to have a trainer. Typically, you're not going to have a medical provider on the sideline. So you pull them out and then you may do a cursory kind of just get an assessment of what's going on. And then of course, take that information to their parent or guardian and talk to them about what this means. And so we'll discuss a little bit of that as we move forward here. So there's a litany of symptoms and they're all listed here from physical symptoms like a headache. Headaches, just as a side note, are obviously difficult to discern. So that's where knowing your player is a little bit of a art. So are they a chronic headache person? Do they have headaches all the time? Or was this something where and they've never had headaches and they had a head contact with somebody or something and now they have a first time headache. That is enough to pull them out and not let them go back in if that is the case. But of course, midline neck pain, nausea, vomiting, that's uncontrolled, dizziness, blurred vision, balance problems, all things that seem obvious, but drowsiness, um, are they emotionally labile? Or can they not stop crying? Are they crying for no reason? Um, all that kind of stuff should make your uh, spidey sense go off a little bit and say, hey, something's just not right here. So this is just a nice little diagram explaining that there are different things. So there can be emotional cues. There can be sleep issues for some of the chronic things. There can be mental things as far as not remembering who you are, where you are, what you're doing, not remembering the last minute or two. Um, there's, of course, the physical part of things, the nausea, the vomiting, the headaches, etc. So there's all these things that kind of make sense in terms of, yes, a head injury might have occurred. So other things to consider, of course, again, where are they, when mental status, an easy thing to ask is, what's your name? Where are you? What's going on? Um, do you feel like you got hit in the head? And you don't need to do a full neurological exam, but you can watch them walk to the sideline. Are they kind of walking like a drunk sailor? Are they able to kind of walk in a straight line? Are they able to move all their limbs? Are they complaining of severe neck pain? Because you also have to remember that with a head injury, the head is connected and sitting right on top of the neck. So if there is a significant head injury, there's a chance that you could have a spinal injury too. So you just want to understand that all these things can happen. So this isn't 
meant this is more from a medical standpoint, but if we were on the sideline, we're going to check mental status. If it's significantly impaired, that's an indication to me or to us that they might need to go to the emergency room for imaging. Can they not even stand in a normal posture? Can they not even walk without falling over? Um, do they have certain cranial nerve or neurological functions that are abnormal, like their pupil dilation, or you, they can't follow your finger, or they can't see on certain phases of their uh, vision? Do they have abnormal strength? They can't lift one arm, and it actually, even if they wanted to, they couldn't lift it, or they have some sort of focal strength deficit. We check reflexes, we check coordination, and we check, check gait or how they're walking. Um, and again, you're not going to have to assess any of these, but understanding those in the back of your mind. So what are the things that would get you pretty excited pretty quickly? Um, so if somebody says they've had the worst headache in their life, they're throwing up and they can't stop. It wasn't just an initial, I got the wind knocked out of me and I threw up because I was scared. It was repetitive vomiting and severe, severe headaches. Um, was there a seizure that was associated with it? Obviously you would have a parent or guardian there hopefully and they would say, well, they've never had a seizure before. So that's a red flag indicator. Are they completely abnormal in terms of their behavior? Um, can you barely get them off the field walking? Are they so lethargic that they just wanna lay down and take a nap right away? Can they not even walk back to the sideline? Do they have slurred speech? Do they have any focal numbness or weakness um, going along with this neurological exam? Do you think they got hit hard enough by something forceful enough that they could actually have a skull fracture? So um, raccoon eyes are basically pathognomonic or go specifically with a basilar skull fracture. And so this is a picture of that. Do they have bruising behind their ears? Again, a indication of a significant intracranial hemorrhage or bleed. So these are things that hopefully you never see, but they're red flags. You immediately know there's a problem. They're not sitting on the sidelines. You're getting into the parents. If it's significant, you call EMS. Um, if not, you can get them to the hospital or to the emergency room. <clears throat> and again, just kind of as a, uh, taking it down a little further just for more information, but really if you end up in the emergency room, I mean, hopefully they do a good full exam and will image you only if necessary, but things that push them towards imaging would be severe headaches, a focal neurological weakness, if you can't stop throwing up, significant drowsiness, loss of consciousness, typically more than 30 seconds, or things just getting worse. So again, these are all bad players, and again, hopefully you never see something like this, but if you do, um, that's what you need to do with it. So how do you manage it afterwards and what happens? So again, typically 90% of the time we're dealing with these mild traumatic brain injuries that will recover on their own with a little rest and a little avoidance of activity. But it's a whole plethora of stuff that kind of goes into this. So normal nutrition, normal hydration, avoiding activities, avoiding sometimes even school and cognitive activities. So for high school athletes, there's a very strict return to play protocol. And your return to play protocol is based on five days. So um, for an NFL game, for example, if they're symptom free by the next day, they start the protocol and they could be back by the next week. But you have to have a normal neurological exam. You have to have no symptoms on no medications for it for at least 24 hours. And then the protocol starts. And it's five successive 24 hour periods where you're gradually doing more <clears throat> cognitive activities and or physical activities to return you to sport. And if you progress through each step, then you get to the end and you return to activity. If you don't, then you stay at that step until you do. And again, you're not going to be taking kids through this. And if they're going through this, um, you may require a, uh, a note from their pediatrician or whoever is seeing them for this. <clears throat> There's also something called post-concussive syndrome. So you worry about multiple concussions and that's kind of what this whole process is about is letting that initial concussion heal and not getting a second hit syndrome or not getting a post-concussive syndrome that could last for months or years or even never go away. 
<clears throat> some of those symptoms include attention and memory issues, and they have all these things that just affect their behavior and ability to prosper and do what they need to do. So in summary, I mean, the things that I would think are important in this setting is, again, it is common to sports. It's common in all sports and all levels of activity. Typically, these all resolve within a week or two, and a lot of times by a week. Um, there are many signs and symptoms that are all fairly straightforward, and just knowing those is going to be helpful to manage or to keep them from having another injury. Um, sometimes uh, doctor visits and imaging are necessary, but most of the time imaging is not. Um, and again, it just requires rest. Just like any injured body part, it needs to rest, whether it's physically or mentally, cognitively, it just needs to rest. So the, <coughs> excuse me, the take home points that I would say for this talk are that understanding that concussions can happen in all sports and all levels. Most of them resolve without issue, um, but um, you're not going to be required to be the medical expert on the sideline, but you must understand the process. <clears throat> it's imperative that you know that these do occur. Try to know your kids as much as possible. Try to uh, pay attention to following the ball or following the activity, or even if you have an assistant, just kind of scanning the field and checking to see if these injuries are happening. Um, understand they happen. So just know those basic symptoms and know what to do. And again, if there are any symptoms of a mechanism that makes it and causes a head injury and they have any new symptoms, they're done for the day. I mean, that's just the easiest rule and it, that applies to everybody. Um, if you are concerned, again, you have to take the kid out and he's done for the day. Talk to the parents, talk to the guardian. <clears throat> if you have an interest and you know a little bit more, you can certainly encourage <clears throat> an emergency room visit or even a visit to their pediatrician, primary care, neurologist, or even somebody like myself before they return. Um, so that's a, a whirlwind on concussion. But again, nobody has to be an expert. It's just a matter of grassroots efforts to coaches and administrators and sport leagues to know that these things happen and that it is a real issue. And the whole goal is to not have a kid get through high school and say, well, I've had 10 concussions. Um, that's not a good thing. That's not what we want. So you're starting with kids that are young um, and we want them to be concussion free and symptom free and have recovered from everything by the time they get to their uh, later sporting years. Um, so with that being said, I open it up to any questions, comments, concerns, issues. Uh, please feel free to interject. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, uh, just feel free to unmute yourself and uh, you can ask Dr. Chad uh, the question of your choice. Uh, I would like to ask one question. Um, so, you know, you, you said it, it requires rest to recover. Um, so one thing that I've been told throughout, you know, all my years was, you know, if there's, uh, you know, any suspicion that a concussion occurred, like, do not let that person go to sleep. Um, can you just kind of explain if, if that's an mm -hmm. actual uh, concern or, you know, just kind of maybe uh, go into detail on how that should be sure. handled? I mean it's probably more of an old wives tale than anything. Um, obviously I didn't discuss that at all in my talk and it doesn't necessarily, it has, it probably more has to be connected with somebody coming off and being extremely lethargic. And so that should be a symptom that you notice when they're awake. So if they're lethargic and it's not time for bed and they shouldn't be tired, then that's an issue that you need to go to the emergency room and get treatment or get evaluation. But if they've had, if they've gotten hit in the head and they get pulled off the field and they have a headache and there are no those, none of those red flag findings, there's no reason that they need to be kept up all night for examination. Now, if you feel comfortable checking on them in a couple hours and just making sure, wake them up and say, 
hey, how are you feeling? Do you know where you are? Do you know what's going on? Can you move all your limbs? Um, do you have, is your headache better? I mean, that's reasonable, but you do not need to, if you have concern enough that they shouldn't sleep because of those red flags, you need to be getting an evaluation. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Sure. Um, so I, I understand that like with I-9, we don't have paramedics and uh, medical staff necessarily on hand uh, <laughs> when we are at our location for the sports. So in the event that we suspect that a player may or may not have a concussion, uh, would it be good practice for us to kind of have like a check sheet, you know, for like uh, name five numbers, have a slight conversation, ask them again what the five numbers are or, you know, basic concussion protocol things that, you know, any athlete would go through and then from there advise the parents as staff members or would it just be best practice to say, okay, at this point in time, you know, there may be a concussion, you know, they kind of cleat to the head, they, you know, like, like you said, collided heads while trying to hit a ball into a goal, you know, just take them to the ER. No, that's a great question. And uh, there's a couple ways to look at it. Um, the first thing comes into mind is, of course, do what's best, do no harm and help. So if they've had a concussion and you're able to take them through some things to figure out what you think and provide that information and be helpful, I think that's great. Um, the flip side is something that Craig may have to discuss. And I don't know what the legalities are, but if you are administering tests and a parent feels that you're providing expert medical care and it leads to a bad outcome, then that might subject you to um, some legal issues, which obviously nobody wants to go through. Right. And, and so our policy is always when in doubt, sit them out. And so from, from our standpoint, it's best just to take the player off the field um, don't let them re-enter the field and possibly um, leave themselves open for further injury or greater harm. Um, we'll always communicate the fact that there's potential for a concussion. And if you see signs of that, we definitely recommend that you take them to a medical professional. Um, for us to evaluate them, it's, not, it's really not our job. Um, you know, and I wouldn't feel comfortable telling anybody or any parent, you know, necessarily that, you know, and, and if, if it's obvious, then yes, you know, we need to make a good recommendation on, listen, your child needs to go visit uh, 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 an ER, you know, uh, or, you know, uh, as soon as possible. Um, but it's tough, you know, in our situation where, you know, if, if we you know, run through a, a, our version of what could be a concussion protocol test and we give bad advice, that's just, that's terrible. So I think really the main thing is to express what we've seen, our concern about the, the um, what, has, what has happened. Do not let the player back onto the field um, if there's any suspicion that a concussion occurred. Yeah, I mean, I think that's perfectly stated because you can assess and you can in your mind get a uh, something that you can provide to the family that's objective. I saw your child get hit in the head. They came off the field. They have a headache. Um, they seem to be improving. I think you just. I think you need to take them home, monitor. If symptoms worsen, I think you need to take them to the emergency room. Probably a one-liner like that covers everything and makes sure that nobody's liable that shouldn't be liable and that the family's not going to do anything based on advice that isn't bulletproof. Right. And, and they, they do sign waivers and, and all that stuff. But I, I think just um, from a company-wide standpoint and as, as staff, we want to do what's best for you know, that child in that situation. Um, but none of us, uh, I don't think any of us are medical professionals other than Dr. Chad right now. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. I know Emily's close. She's getting there. Morgan too. So. so I have a question. At what point can we 
let them come back onto the field then? So the easy answer is you never let them on the same day. So if they get pulled off for concern of a head injury, they're done. They're done for the entire day. And then you turn them over to the family guardian. And then they need to, if they had medical care, they probably need to provide you, I don't know what the policy is, but if it seems logical that they would provide you with a note from a medical provider saying that they've been cleared for return to sport. All right, is that typical, Craig? Yeah, so, um, so usually it's, you know, uh, basically that, that advice, which is we'll, we'll send them off with their parents and let them know what our concern is. And then, you know, like if, if the child condition improves, they're more than welcome to come back and keep us, keep us in the loop as far as how they're progressing throughout the week, you know, um, because we've only experienced a, a handful of what I think were concussions at our fields. So um, three, I know for sure, you know, and it's been six years, four seasons a year. It doesn't happen that often, but I think for us to be able to at least spot the signs um, and then actively, you know, make parents aware of it. And, and that's our responsibility. Our responsibility is not to let them back out on the field if we think there is a chance that uh, a, con a concussion has occurred. Um, I think it would be totally irresponsible to allow a kid back into a game um, and take that chance. Yeah, so I agree. I mean, once they have symptoms, they're done for the day and they don't return until they're symptom free. And uh, if you got the impression that it was a prolonged course of treatment and it was complicated, you probably won't see the kid again um, until another season. But um, if they did, you may request a letter. But if they get better and they come back and they're symptom free by the next game, and uh, that's, I mean, that's a different situation. Yeah. Does anybody else have um, anything? Yeah. yeah. I got something. Uh, so real quick. So for that standpoint, if you're saying, you know, if they're symptom free, they don't necessarily need a note. Cause I know from my own standpoint, it was, if you're pulling me from a game, there's no way I'm missing the next game and whatever I have to do to get that, you know, if that's lying or whatever, I, I did what I had to do in football. Um, I played <laughs> multiple games with concussions, but um, I think that's how, so how do you police that? Right. Cause because at the end of the day, as a competitor, you're going to want to play, um, right, and not and not just sit out. So get, yeah, and, and Shane, I I completely get that. The good thing, like for us, we're we're not dealing with high school varsity football. You know, it is rec league sports, and I know some of our kids like they're dying to play week after week after week. But yeah, and I think that's just keeping in communication with the parents. And checking in. And so if I know that a child on our field has uh, suffered a concussion, I will reach out to them. And, you know, uh, I want that communication back and forth, knowing that they're progressing in a positive way. Because if there is any concern that, you know, returning back to action too soon is super dangerous. And we know that now. And so from our standpoint, you know, we'll hold them. If that means I'll give them a credit for, you know, uh, for the next season or whatever it is, you know, the child safety is at, you know, <clears throat> the paramount of, of our situation at that point. It's, it's so few, but it's so important that we handle it correctly. 